Introduction Exposition of the Question of the Meaning of Being The Necessity, Structure, and Priority of the Question of Being The Necessity for Explicitly Restating the Question of Being This question has today been forgotten, even though, in our time, we deem it progressive to give our approval to metaphysics again, it is held that we have been exempted from the exertions of a newly rekindled Gigantomachia Perites Ushias, a battle of giants concerning being. Yet the question we are touching upon is not just any question. It is one which provided a stimulus for the researches of Plato and Aristotle, only to subside from then on as a theme for actual investigation. What these two men achieved was to persist through many alterations and retouchings down to the logic of Hegel, and what they wrested with the utmost intellectual effort from the phenomena, fragmentary and incipient though it was, has long since become trivialized. Not only that, on the basis of the Greeks' initial contributions towards an interpretation of being, a dogma has been developed which not only declares the question about the meaning of being to, to be superfluous, but sanctions its complete neglect. It is said that being is the most universal and the emptiest of concepts. As such, it resists every attempt at definition. Nor does this most universal and hence indefinable concept require any definition, for everyone uses it constantly and already understands what he means by it. In this way, that which the ancient philosophers found continually disturbing as something obscure and hidden has taken on a clarity and self-evidence such that if anyone continues to ask about it, he is charged with an error of method. At the beginning of our investigation, it is not possible to give a detailed account of the presuppositions and prejudices which are constantly re-implanting and fostering the belief that an inquiry into being is unnecessary. They are rooted in ancient ontology itself, and it will not be possible to interpret that ontology adequately until the question of being has been clarified and answered and taken as a clue, at least if we are to have regard for the soil from which the basic ontological concepts developed, and if we are to see whether the categories have been demonstrated in a way that is appropriate and complete. We shall therefore carry the discussion of these presuppositions only to the point at which the necessity for restating the question about the meaning of being becomes plain. There are three such presuppositions. First, it has been maintained that being is the most universal concept. Illud quod primo cadit sub apprehensione est ens quius intellectus includitur in omnibus quacumque quis apprehendit. An understanding of being is already included in conceiving anything which one apprehends in entities, but the universality of being is not that of a class or genus. The term being does not define the realm of entities which is uppermost when these are articulated conceptually according to genus and species. The universality of being transcends any universality of genus. In medieval ontology, being is designated as a transcendence. Aristotle himself knew the unity of this transcendental universal as a unity of analogy, in contrast to the multiplicity of the highest generic concepts applicable to things. With this discovery, in spite of his dependence on the way in which the ontological question had been formulated by Plato, he put the problem of being on what was in principle a new basis. To be sure, 
even Aristotle, fail to clear away the darkness of these categorical interconnections. In medieval ontology, this problem was widely discussed, especially in the Thomist and Scotist schools, without reaching clarity as to principles. And when Hegel at last defines being as the indeterminate, immediate, and makes this definition basic for all the further categorical explications of his logic, he keeps looking in the same direction as ancient ontology, except that he no longer pays heed to Aristotle's problem of the unity of being as over against the multiplicity of categories applicable to things. So, if it is said that being is the most universal concept, this cannot mean that it is the one which is clearest or that it needs no further discussion. It is rather the darkest of all. 2. It has been maintained, secondly, that the concept of being is indefinable. This is deduced from its supreme universality, and rightly so, if definitio fit per genus proximum et differentium specificum. Being cannot indeed be conceived as an entity, anti non aditur aliqua natura. Nor can it acquire such a character as to have the term entity applied to it. Being cannot be derived from higher concepts by, by definition, nor can it be presented through lower ones. But does this imply that being no longer offers a problem? Not at all. We can infer only that being cannot have the character of an entity. Thus, we cannot apply to being the concept of definition as presented in traditional logic, which itself has its foundations in ancient ontology, and which, within certain limits, provides a justifiable way of characterizing entities. The indefinability of being does not eliminate the question of his meaning. It demands that we look that question in the face. 3. Thirdly, it is held that being is of all concepts the one that is self-evident. Whenever one cognizes anything or makes an assertion, whenever one comports oneself towards entities, even towards oneself, some use is made of being, and this expression is held to be intelligible without further ado, just as everyone understands. The sky is blue, I am merry, and the like. But here we have an average kind of intelligibility, which merely demonstrates that this is unintelligible. It makes manifest that in any way of comporting oneself towards entities as entities, even in any being towards entities as entities, there lies a priori an enigma. The very fact that we already live in an understanding of being, and that the meaning of being is still veiled in darkness, proves that it is necessary in principle to raise this question again. Within the range of basic philosophical concepts, especially when we come to the concept of being, it is a dubious procedure to invoke self-evidence, if indeed the self-evident Kant's covert judgments of the common reason is to become the sole explicit and abiding theme for one's analytic, the business of philosophers. By considering these prejudices, however, we have made plain not only that the question of being lacks an answer, but that the question itself is obscure and without direction. So, if it is to be revived, this means that we must first work out an adequate way of formulating it.